But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus <coughs> came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. <clears throat> Let's go to Luke chapter 6, and verse 46. One of the most intriguing questions that the Lord asked when he was here on earth. <clears throat> he, uh, he, asked a, he was asked a lot of questions when he was here on earth. Of course, man, I would too. <laughs> I'd ask a lot of questions if I got to see him face to face when he was walking on the earth. But he also himself asked a lot of questions <clears throat> to people. And here's one. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Well, Let's pray. Father, please help us tonight to listen to your word. And we ask you to challenge us and, and change us. And guide and direct our thoughts, guide and direct our will, and uh, help us to make the right decisions tonight with what we hear from your word. Thank you for this truth. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for being a God that's there for us, available for us, a, a leader, a guide, <clears throat> an encourager, a Lord, the Lord, our Savior. Thank you for all that. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Let's pray. Lord, thank you again for all the great things that we get to hear here, the music that we have, the songs, the words people who play and sing their lives, and to thank you for the Word of God and, and the Holy Spirit and, and just the whole idea of church. We're so grateful for that. Now, please help us now to enjoy the rest of the service let, and let you speak to us. And uh, again, Lord, may, when decision time comes at the end here, help us to make the right one. In Jesus' name, amen. We read in, in uh, John chapter 20, verse 28, Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. It was obvious from that statement that Jesus was the Lord of Thomas's life. And I want to ask you tonight, is he yours? Mom. Is he yours? <clears throat> I don't mean you, you call him Lord. I'm asking you, is he your Lord? That's what I'd like to know. That's what you ought to be able to think about and examine in your own heart, if he is truly the Lord of your life. If we were to turn, you were to turn on the radio today and listen to the average radio preacher, they would say to go to heaven, you must receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You'd find that, that on the TV also. They say that a lot. This teaching is false. Now, it would be easy to misunderstand the message tonight, but it, 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 I want to, it clearly understood that I do not believe in Lordship salvation. I do not believe you have to make Jesus the Lord of your life to be saved. You don't have to. To, make, to be saved, you need to make Jesus your Savior. That's what you need to do. Okay, And so <clears throat> Jesus will never become the Lord over every area, area of your life <clears throat> while you're here on earth. If he did, you'd be perfect, and you, would, won't, be, you, you uh, <clears throat> won't be like that till you get to heaven. However, he does want you to make him the Lord of your life after you're saved so he can work on your shortcomings and get you ready for the day when you will finally crown him absolute Lord of all. And you're going to see what I'm talking about as we go along here. Thomas had joined the disciples in the upper room in this passage here. He was seriously doubting the, the truth of the story of, the, of Jesus' resurrection and appearance to the disciples when he wasn't there. Suddenly, Jesus appears and Thomas sees him and cries out, My Lord and my God. Now notice the personal word there, My Lord and my God. Other places Thomas had called Jesus Lord, but this is the first place where he had addressed him as my Lord. That means, that word my there means mine own, as if he only belonged to Thomas. He's my Lord. He's my God. He had accepted Christ as his Savior almost three years earlier, and had often addressed Jesus as Lord, but now it had finally sunk in. The doubter of all doubters had decided to make Jesus his personal Lord. He had finally thrust his life at the feet of Jesus, and now he would believe everything that Jesus said. 
So before I get go on, let me just say that you don't get saved by receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You are saved by receiving his gift of eternal life and trusting him to save you. When we're, and when we're through tonight, I think you'll understand why this is true. Now, to some in this room, the question is this. Have you accepted Jesus as your Savior? Have you ever done that? Okay, he, he is the Savior. He came to save people. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's why he came to earth. He came primarily to save people from going to hell. He came to pay the penalty for your sins. See, you're a sinner, and you deserve to go to hell to pay for those sins. And so Jesus uh, does not want you to go to hell because he loves you like we sung about tonight. And he, so he came, paid the penalty for you. Instead of you going to hell and paying for your sins, Jesus suffered that for you. He paid the penalty. He bought you the gift of eternal life. And the Bible says, the price he paid for that gift was his life. And the Bible says three days later, he rose from the dead. And if you'll call on him and accept him as your only Savior, your only hope for heaven, trust him completely to get you into heaven and nothing else and nobody else, then you would be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's what he wants you to do. Now, have you done that? If you haven't done that, you need to do that tonight. To those who have made him your Savior, the question is, have you accepted him as your Lord? Now, again, he, he will not be completely Lord, and we're going to tell you what Lord means here in a second, but he will not be completely your Lord. In other words, absolutely, totally Lord, Lord over your life, until uh, you get to heaven, because there's going to be times you rebel against him. There's going to be times where you do things that he does not want you to do. And at that moment, he's not Lord of your life. But have you accepted him? Have you said to him, I want you to be Lord of my life? I want you to do that. Now that comes after you accept him as your Savior. And it's something you should do. Now let me give you the meaning of the word Lord. <clears throat> I'm going to do something I hardly ever do. I'm going to tell you what the Greek word is. Aren't you impressed? It's curious, curious, K-U-R-I-O-S. Aren't you impressed? <clears throat> I, I took Greek in college, and I use it once in a great while. But curious means several things. First of all, first of all, it means owner, to be an owner or to possess. One who has disposal of anything because he is the owner or the possessor of it. Let me give you an illustration. For instance, when I bought, when I bought my car, it is my car. It belongs to me. I bought it. I can drive that car when I want. If you want to put it like this, I am Lord of that car. I am Lord of that car. I can drive it whenever I want to drive it. I can drive it as fast as I want to drive it. Except for, you know, I could. I'll get a ticket, but I could. In other words, that car's not going to tell me how fast I can drive it. All right? <clears throat> I'm going to decide that. I can turn it wherever I want to turn it. I can drive it wherever I want to drive it. The car must obey me because it's mine. I bought it. All right? <clears throat> In the same way, Jesus bought us. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. The Bible says in this verse, these verses 19 and 20, What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So you are bought with a price. He is the owner. He bought you. Okay? Now, a lot of people don't recognize that. They may hear it. They may read it right in those verses. But they don't recognize. They don't accept that. Wow. He is the owner. He is the Lord. That's, right. that's one of the that's the Greek word, Greek meaning for the word Lord, owner or possessor. So, that means if he's the owner, he can use us whenever he wants to. I mean, man, I'll tell you, there's some days, uh, just the illustration, soul winning. Some days I go out soul winning and I don't see anybody saved. Other days I go out and I've seen two, three, four, five, six, seven saved at a time. Whatever he wants, 
He's the owner. See? It's whatever he wants. He can use me whenever he wants. He can, he can use us as fast as he wants to use us. Some Christians grow slow. Some Christians grow fast. If he's Lord, it's whatever he wants. I know people that got saved and, and they surrendered their life, but they didn't grow as fast as somebody else who got saved and surrendered their life. Why? God knows each one of us. He knows how fast each one of us can grow. And so what he's looking for is people who are willing to grow, people who surrender to him to grow. But he can drive us or use us as fast as he wants to. It's up to him. He's the owner. He's the possessor. He has disposal of any of whatever he owns, and he owns me. He can turn our lives whichever way he wants to turn them. Down any road he wants to take it. If he wants to take us down the road of happiness, everything's clicking, all the bless the blessings of heaven are falling upon us, he can do that. If he wants to take us down the road of heartache, we experience death or sickness or money problems. We have burdens, finances, jobs. He can take us down whatever road he wants. Why? Because he's the owner. He's the boss. He's the Lord. He's the possessor. I am his. I belong to him. And he can do whatever he wants to do. And you know what? Because we have made him Lord of our life, in, in most of the time of our life, we're not going to fight him about that. We're just going to let him do it. We're going to let him use us whenever he wants to use us. We're going to grow as fast as he wants us to grow. We are going to, we're going to allow him to turn our lives whichever way he wants to turn us. If it's down the road of happiness, if it's down the road of heartaches, if it's down the road of burdens, that's totally up to him. Because he's Lord. You see? <clears throat> now remember, you say that word a lot when you're talking about God. You say Lord. When you pray, you probably say that a lot. Dear Lord. Just remember, you're saying, dear owner, dear possessor. Dear the one who has the right to do whatever he wants with me. That's what you're saying. You see, really, that's what you're saying. We, we use, you know, religion, just like every other part of life, is so full of cliches. And so full of things we just take for granted. And we so flippantly use that word, Lord. We've got to think about what... It means. That's why Jesus said in Luke 6, 46, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? I mean, if you're going to call me Lord, I expect you to do what I say because you're telling me you're my, you're my owner. You possess me. I'm at your disposal. So I'm going to do whatever you say. As the owner... As the Lord, he can use our lives wherever he wants to use us. Wherever. But there are Christians that say, well, I'll never go over there. I'll never serve over there. There are Christians that say, well, I'll never do that. I'll never work in junior church. I'll never work a bus ministry. I'll never teach Sunday school class. What gave you the right to say stuff like that? You didn't buy you. He bought you. You belong to him. The Bible clearly says that. If you've accepted him as your savior, he bought you with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your spirit and your body, which are God's. Did you see that? Which are God's. Not yours. God's. Therefore, that, it, that makes him the owner, the possessor, the Lord, the master. And so Jesus says, why do you call me that and you don't do what I say? He can use us wherever he wants to use us. I mean, I'm 61 years old. And, and I think, I, I, I believe, I'm sure of it, most of my life is, I mean, it's over. It's half over, over half over. If, but if God came to me and said, right, uh, said tomorrow, tonight, I want you to go to the mission field. Okay. I have to go. He's the Lord. 
He's the boss. Now, my wife wouldn't go, but I'd have to go. No, I'm kidding. She would go. She would go wherever God wanted her to go. I know her. But that's the whole thing. See, I have no say-so over that. He's the Lord. Wherever he wants. I mean, I was totally content to, to stay at, at East Bay Baptist Church all my life. Uh, I was, I know, I know from, from, um, from just looking back on the past that my pastor, want, I, he wanted me to be the pastor of that church when he left, when he retired. He wanted me to take over. It was up to him when he passed away in 1995, uh, January 1995, I'd, be, I'd been taken over that church and pastored it. His son-in-law and daughter drove up to, uh, to uh, drove, drove down rather to Winchester, Indiana, where I was pastor at the time, took us out to eat, and basically offered me the position of being the pastor there. But you know what? It, it's not what I wanted. It's whatever God wants. It doesn't matter. See, he's Lord. He can use our lives wherever he wants. Well, I'm going to live in Washington the rest of my life. Well, you can say that, and, may, and that's, there's nothing wrong with hoping you do, because if especially this is your home state, but you got to say to God wherever you want. Mm -hmm. That's right. He's the Lord. He's the owner. He's the owner. I must obey him. I must. You see? And so, so must you. You know, if my car refuses to obey me, I take it to the shop and I fix it. I get it fixed. So does Jesus. If I don't obey him, he takes me to the shop and he fixes me. Hebrews chapter 12 says he chastens us. If my car won't obey me anymore, then I won't use it anymore. And Jesus won't use us anymore. He puts us away if we will refuse to obey. You see, he's Lord. He's the possessor. He's the owner of you. And you know, I have no problem with that at all. I have no problem with that at all. I mean, good night. You know, since he died on the cross for my, well, first of all, he didn't have to die on the cross for my sins. He just created me. He's God. He put the breath of life in me. So I just need to be quiet, let him be God. And I'll just be what I am. And that is a piece of dust that he breathed life into. But then you add the cross on top of that. You have him go to the cross and do what he did to purchase my salvation so I wouldn't have to go to hell, so I could go to heaven when I die. Why in the world would I ever, ever think for a moment that I have a right to do what I want to do? Why do I even have a right for a second to think, this is my life, I can do whatever I want with it? No! I don't have a right to anything except to do what he says. That's it. Why? Because he bought me. Now, if you don't like the idea of him being owner, why don't you have a nice conversation with him and try to talk to him about giving your salvation back to him? Now, he won't do that. He's not an Indian giver. He doesn't take salvation back. And aren't you glad he does? Mom. Because some of us live like, like we don't owe him a thing. Mm -hmm. Come on now. You know? But it means the possessor or owner. Second thing Lord means, it means master. One to whom service is due. One to whom service is due. It means master. And also one who rules others. Now, he deserves it. He deserves to rule us. And you know what? We owe it to him. Can I ask you a question? Do you ever think about it? Do you think you owe him anything? And if you do, how are you going to pay him back? How are you going to pay him back? There's only one way you can even come close. And that's to, to make him Lord of your life. Let him be the master. Let him be the one who rules, not just in name, not just in a title, 
but in, in action, in reality. You see, he's the master. He deserves it. We owe it. We owe him service. And you know what? With God, with, since he is the Lord, there is no choice. Here's what it comes down to. To obey him equals peace. To disobey him equals ruin. That's the way it is. There's no other way around it. <clears throat> now, just as his title gives him service due, <clears throat> I ought to give him that service that's due him. He is the master. Absolute master. I don't know what it takes to get some Christians to get a hold of this. But I think you need to, you know, I believe in a literal word-for-word -word Bible. Amen. And I think the, that he put the word Lord in there on purpose. And it means owner and possessor on purpose. It means uh, master on purpose. He wants to, and here's the great thing about it. When you, when you finally say, okay, yeah, that's true, I... I need to make him Lord of my life. He's my Savior. I need to make him Lord of my life. When you submit to that, man, the blessings come. Mm -hmm. God puts your life in order. That's right. God orders your steps. Amen. God gives you a purpose. God gives you his plan. God gives you his help. God teaches his word. Right. God gives you his power. Mm -hmm. I mean, God gives you his forgiveness, his mercy, his grace. And he just pours it out on you. And you, you really experience what Jesus was talking about when he said, I have come that they might have life, they might have it more abundantly. That's right. <clears throat> you know, you have, you have in a family, you have the head of the house, household. Now, um, if I walk, if, when, I, when I knock on the door and I get inside a house and I meet a husband and wife and kids, which you hardly ever see that anymore, but uh, husband, wife, kids, uh, right away my thought is the man's the head of the house. That's the way it's set up in the Bible. He's the head of the house. But, some, but you know what? In a lot of cases, that's just by name only. It's not by deed. Because when you sit down and examine, then you get to know the family. It's obvious that the woman and the kids run the house. The husband is the head of the house in, in name only, not in reality. <clears throat> Employees. You have employer, employer over employee. That's what, when, it, when you're talking about Lord and ma uh, Master, one who rules others, one who runs things. We're talking about like the head of the house, and we're talking about an employer over an employee. <clears throat> we're talking about an owner of an animal. <clears throat> I mean, the owner tells the animal, jump, roll over. Animal responds. So that's the way it is. It's not the other way around. Uh, have, you ever seen a, have you ever seen a dog walk an adult? Don't tell me you have. Come on, give me a break. In reality, the owner is walking the dog. I mean, sure, the dog is pulling and the owner is going like this. <laughs> but it started out, the, owner, the, 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 the dog did not take the leash and put it on the owner and say we're going for a walk. The pet is walked by the owner. Okay? Uh, you don't see the, you, know, you never walk into a, a person's house and you see, and the dog comes up to you and says, hey, watch this new trick I taught my owner. And, he's, and the dog sits down and says to the owner, roll over. No, you don't see that. It's not the way it is. The owner tells the animal what to do. And the animal responds. You see, the captain, captain of a ship, he gives orders to, the, to, those that, to his crew. And they must be obeyed. Or you know what it's called? Yes. Mutiny. You see? But the captain gives the orders and the crew follows the orders. Not the other way around. You see, <clears throat> if the captain is going to run a successful uh, a ship, he's, the crew has got to do what he says. You see, if an employer is going to have a successful business, the employee has got to do what the employer says, not the other way around. If going to have a successful family, the husband must run the family the way the Bible says to do it, and the people in the family must submit to that. Or you're going to have a household that's out of whack, out of God's order. And when it's out of God's order, there's a word for it. It's called chaos. You see? And it's the same way with us. 
our relationship with the Lord. He's the master. We don't run him. He runs us. We don't tell him what to do. He tells us what to do. Because he's the Lord. He's the master. You see, that's the way it's supposed to be. Now, <clears throat> Ephesians 6 says we are to serve him in fear and in trembling and in singleness of heart. There has to be a respect there. I think, I think that Christians have lost respect for God in a lot of cases. Yeah. I really think they have. Come on now. There's no fear. One of the words that, when you talk about fearing the Lord, one of the things that means is to have to be in awe of him. I think we've lost that. You know why? Because we brought him down to our level. You see pictures of him and he's a long-haired hippie freak. <clears throat> that's what he is. And so many pictures and that's not him. That's not him. He's not one of the boys. He's not a cool dude. He's God. And forever will be God. And there needs to be a fear of God that Christians have. And Christians have lost the fear of God. He talks about, in Ephesians 6, about trembling. I think about what would happen if I don't make him Lord of my life. I fear about, think about what would happen to my loved ones if I don't uh, make him Lord of my life and follow him. I think about the results and, 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 all, and the consequences of it. And it causes, uh, brings fear to me, brings trembling to me. You see? Lord means owner or possessor. Lord means master, one who rules, one who rules others, one to whom service is due. Lord also means he is king. He is in supreme in authority. He is the number one. What he says takes precedence over any other authority in our life. Oh, my soul. Can I go take you to Acts chapter 5, verse 29? Acts chapter 5, verse 29. We're not dealing with, with, a, with a passive uh, God. We don't deal with a God who says, whatever, at all. In Acts 5, 29, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Amen. Name me a man who has as much authority as God does. Can I tell you, can I just tell you, ladies, your husband does not have as much authority as God does. She's right. Almost, though. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> if your husband tells you to commit a sin, you don't have to obey your husband. And by the way, shame on you guys that do that to your wife. I've had, I've had people say, well, if your husband tells you to stay home from church, you should stay home from church. Show me that in the Bible. You ought to obey God rather than men. God said, be faithful to church. People have told me that. Say, I ask them, I say, okay, well, tell me how far we're going to take that. If your husband tells you that he wants you to commit adultery right in front of him, are you going to do that? Oh, I would never do that. Why not? You're using the scripture to, to miss church because uh, you ought to obey your husband uh, in, in all things. How far are you going to take that? No, God's not talking about obeying him in the area of sin. <laughs> There's never an excuse to sin. That's right. That's right. The fact is, if there's a choice between obeying any man and obeying God, if it comes down where there's a choice, God is the Lord. Amen. He is the master. He is the king. And we must always remember that. You see? He makes the laws and the rules that govern us. And if the government tells us to do something that we're not that, that uh, God doesn't want us to do, then we don't have to do it. That's right. If the government tells us to stop doing something God wants us to do, we don't have to stop doing it. If the government and God agree, we need to obey our government. 
as long as they're in agreement with God. But once anybody tells us to do something that violates what the Bible tells us to do, we are no longer under obligation to obey that authority. Because he is the king. Amen. And unfortunately, we're living in a society where that conflict is beginning to grow more and more. Yeah. There's all throughout history, you read the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Um, you'll see in that chapter a lot of people died because they refused to obey authority that told them to go against the Bible. We sang a song in school this week, Faith of Our Fathers. Oh, holy faith, we will be true to thee till death. Why would, you get, why would you die? Why would you die for your faith? Why would somebody kill you for your faith? You know why? Because you won't do something they told you to do. And that's right. You ought to obey God rather than men. Now, the question that Jesus said asked was, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Now, he may not be Lord now, but he will be someday. Go to Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. He may not be the Lord of your life now. He may not be the, the you may not treat him like the owner now. You may not treat him like the possessor of your life now. You may not treat him like the master now. You may not treat him like the king, the supreme and authority of your life now, but he will be someday. Philippians 2, verse number 9, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Savior? No is Lord. Every tongue. There will be people that will not accept him as their savior. So they won't go to heaven. But one thing they will realize is he's Lord. He is the master. He is the king. He is the owner and possessor of everything. And they'll do it to the glory of, to the glory of God the Father. You see, <clears throat> God the Father made Jesus Lord. Every knee will bow, just at the mention of his name. Unlike today, his name is used as a curse word. His name is used in vain. His name is ignored. But it won't be someday. Wow. Every tongue will confess that he is Lord. The unsaved will say it. The saved will say it. The saved disobedient will say it. But every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And I want to tell you that you have an opportunity today. Uh, you don't have to wait till that moment to confess him as Lord. You can confess him as Lord tonight. You can decide tonight he is going to be the, he, the ruler and possessor and master and king, supreme authority of my life. And my life is going to show it from now on. That he is Lord. I'm not just going to call him Lord. He, I'm going to show him I'm Lord by doing the things that he says. Amen. Now, how do you know when he is Lord? Go to Matthew chapter 22, verse 36. How do I know? Matthew 22, verse 36. Jesus said this. When asked what the great commandment in the law was, Jesus said unto him in verse 37, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. So how do you know when Jesus is Lord? When you love him supremely. Amen. You love him with all your heart. That means he's at the center of your life. You love him with all your soul. That means that, that your, your, uh, your relationships with people, he is at the center of those relationships. You love him with all your strength. That means he, he, you live for him. I mean, you put your energy into doing what he says and living for what he wants you to live for. Amen. Another place talks about loving him with all your mind. You, you, you only think the thoughts. You, you make sure you're, you fight to make sure your mind is thinking the right kind of thoughts. Philippians 4, 8 thoughts. You love him supremely. There's not a question about that in your words and in your actions. You cannot be stopped. Nothing discourages you. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 7. Nothing discourages you enough to stop you. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 7. 
Isaiah chapter 50, verse 7. The Bible says here, For the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. Here's a, here's a person who said, I cannot be stopped. Nothing's going to stop me. Why? Because the Lord God will help me. The Lord. You see? You know he's Lord when you love him supremely, when you cannot be stopped. Nothing discourages you enough to stop you. I mean, you, you know what? Can I just share this with you? You can grow as far as you want to grow. You can get close to God as you want to get. You're still going to get discouraged. But there are Christians that get this, discouraged and they're stopped. But there are other Christians that have grown enough and have put Jesus in a proper position in their life that even though they get discouraged, they cannot be stopped. That's right. You love him supremely. I mean, you, you, you know he's Lord when you openly talk about him. Psalm 73, 28. You openly talk about him. You're not ashamed to talk about others, to talk to others about him. You, you're, you're redeemed, so you say so. You witness. You're a witness. You're known as a Christian who witnesses. You openly talk about him. You know he is Lord when he is always before you. You're always constantly thinking, what would Jesus do? Not what, what do I want, but what would Jesus do? What does he want me to do? How would he want me to handle this situation? What, what would please him? You know he's Lord when your steps are ordered by him. Psalm, Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a good man are ordered, arranged by the Lord. You see? You know he is Lord when you acknowledge him in all your ways. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. Who? The Lord. And he shall direct thy paths. That's how you know he's Lord. Now, let me just close by saying this. How do you do this? How do you make him Lord? Well, first thing is, and I'm just, just sharing with you, it's not that hard. If you again, it comes down to really believing this. Believe in the Bible. You realize you belong to Him. You realize that. Now that's the truth, whether you realize it or not. That is the truth. But you realize it clicks in you. I mean, it, you you think about that. You understand that. You accept that. I belong to Him. I belong to Him. So therefore, since I belong to Him. I better find out what he wants. And I better do what he wants me to do in my life because I belong to him. You realize that. It really, it's more than just a, a, a something you, you just think you, you say. It's more than that. It's, it's down here. You really get it. I belong to the Lord. Now I belong to Jesus. When they sing that song, you say, yes, I, that's me. I belong to him. You belong to him, and since you belong to him, you yield yourself to God. Romans 12, 1 and 2, you present your bodies a living sacrifice to him. You yield yourself, you yield your whole self, your mind, your body, everything to him. You yield that to him. Here, Lord, you, it's all yours. You take it. I'm not going to treat these eyes like they're my eyes, or these ears like they're my ears, or this mouth like it's my mouth. It's yours. It's all yours. You yield your members of your body as instruments of righteousness to him. Romans 6.13 You present yourself to him. You do what he says. It's kind of like this. Go to John chapter 2 verse 5. I, I just think this is such a key statement in the Christian life right here. When Jesus was asked to, to, uh, to ch change the water at the wedding feast into wine, which is really grape juice, <clears throat> um, Mary said to the servants, and this is so important, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. That's when you know he's Lord. What are you going to do? Whatever God wants me to. Whatever he says, I'll do it. 
I, he didn't say, Mary didn't say, whatever he says to you, go, go to the other room and sit down and think about it, whether or not you're going to do it. Take some time and pray about it. No, 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 whatever he saith unto you, do it. It's that simple. That's when you know, <clears throat> that's when you know he's Lord, and that's how you do it. That's how you make him Lord. You just say, I'm, I'm just going to do whatever he says. And he asked the question, why are you calling me Lord and not doing the things that I say? It's contradictory. Because if he's Lord, he's master. If he's Lord, he's king. He's supreme authority in your life. If he's Lord, he's the owner and possessor. That means he can do, he can do with you what you do with your car. He can, he can use you whenever he wants. He can uh, use you or, or grow you as fast as he wants to grow you. He can turn your lives whichever way he wants to turn you, take down, you down any road. He can use your life wherever he wants to use you. And if you're not going to obey him, he can fix you. He's Lord. He's absolute Lord. Thomas finally realized that Jesus not only saved him, but he ought to let him run his life. What will it be tonight? Will Jesus be just your Savior? Or will you, like, will you, like Thomas, fall to your feet and say, My Lord and my God? Wow. What a sight. That must have been. He fell at his feet and said, my Lord and my God. Now that's Thomas. What about you? Are you falling at his feet and saying, my Lord and my God? You made him your Savior. How about making him your Lord? Think about that. Where is he in your life? Is it obvious in your heart, in your mind, in your actions, is it obvious that he is the owner or possessor of you? Is it obvious that he is the master of your life? Is it obvious that he is king, he is supreme authority in your life? If he's not, then it's time you said what Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for the word of God. Thank you for the truth. Please have your way in this time of invitation. Help us to make the right decisions. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Is Jesus your Savior? Not the Savior, but is he your Savior? Do you remember a time when you realized you were a sinner headed for hell? That Jesus died and paid, for, paid your way out of hell and paid for the gift of eternal life? And it was offered to it, he offered eternal life to you, and you accepted it. You remember doing that? If you say yes, preacher, I remember doing that. I remember asking Jesus to be my Savior. There's no doubt in my mind when I die, I'm going to heaven because the Bible says I am. If that's you, you raise your hand. I'd like to see that. I'm sure I'm going to heaven. You may lower your hands. How many would say, preacher, I'm not sure. I, I don't remember doing that. I don't remember asking Jesus to be my Savior. I'm not sure where I'd go when I die. I'd like to go to heaven, but I'm not sure I would. If that's you, you raise your hand. I'm not sure I'd go to heaven. I'd like to go, but I'm not sure. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I'd like to ask you a question, Christian. You raise your hand saying you were saved. Is Jesus your Lord? Is he the boss? Is he the master? Is he the king? Is he the owner? Does he possess your life? Is it clear in the way you live? I mean... <clears throat> Look at your life. If you're not reading your Bible every day, you can't say he's Lord. If you're not spending time in prayer every day, you can't say he's Lord. If you've been saved but not baptized and because you don't want to get baptized, you can't say he's Lord. If you're not telling other people about Jesus, if you're not spreading the, his gospel, you can't say he's Lord. Why don't you make him Lord tonight, like Thomas did? My Lord, not just the Lord, but my Lord and my God. You can do that tonight. Just leave your seat, come down the aisle, kneel here and say, just like Thomas said to him, say it to him. Exact words Thomas said. And then get up and let him run your life. If here tonight you're not sure you're saved, just the moment the song of invitation is going to start. When the song begins and, and the song is sung, when Miss Angela sings it, you just leave your seat, come up front and say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. I want to see from the Bible how I can be sure.
If you tell me that, we'll have somebody take the Bible and show you from God's Word how you can have eternal life. If you've been saved but not baptized since you got saved, you can do that tonight. Come up and tell me, Pastor, I'd like to get baptized. If you I want to join the church, you're not a member but you'd like to join, you come up and tell me, Pastor, I'd like to join the church. But if God spoke to your heart and you, you would say that you believe that Jesus is the Lord, but you've never made him your Lord. You never said, my Lord and my God. You never showed him with your life and your heart that he is your Lord. Why don't you do that tonight? All right, let's all stand. The song will begin. You'll obey the Holy Spirit and do what he tells you to do.